Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, it seems to make sense to start with draft mediation clauses, and by that I mean inserting clauses to mediate rather than litigate in the agreements that most of you have spent draft on a regular basis. Mediation is already taking off um, in this jurisdiction, but it seems to me it's still greatly underused. And if it's really going to get started, it, it, the leadership really, I think, has to come from, from lawyers, and in particular from the solicitor side of the profession. For two reasons. Firstly, because you are the first port of call, for the most part, the parties in a dispute. And secondly, because one of the services that you offer clients is the drafting of agreements. It could be private client agreements, uh, deeds, trusts, or it could be uh, more familiar territory, uh, commercial agreements, partnerships, joint ventures, even something straightforward like a sale of goods act. Uh, start agreement. And I would suggest that when solicitors now are offering that service to their clients, one of the things they ought to be considering is inserting some form of ADR, and in particular having regard to mediation. And in that way, mediation is likely to uh, develop as a, as a really credible kind of dispute resolution uh, process. So <clears throat> that's what I mean when I say um, a mediation clause. Now, I suspect most of you have already drafted alternative dispute resolution clauses. Um, arbitration clauses are pretty well established. The difficulty is we can't, unfortunately, just substitute the word arbitration for mediation because they are conceptually very different, of course. Um, arbitration is a, a binding process in the sense that there's no walking away once you're in it if you don't like the way it's going. Whereas, of course, with mediation, one of the principles is you are free pretty much to walk away. Um, Arbitration, once the decision has been made, it is made, it is imposed upon the parties. But of course, that's completely different to mediation. So with arbitration, it's comparatively straightforward to force it onto unwilling parties. Uh, and more importantly for the court, it's very easy to police. And that's the court's great concern, it seems to me, when you look at the reluctance to give effect to clauses to negotiate or to mediate. The court's primary concern is how do we police this particular contract term. The great advantage of mediation is its flexibility. But that's one of the things that makes it difficult to force it onto parties that don't really have any genuine appetite for it. And it makes it difficult for the court to police. But the courts are slowly starting to recognise uh, mediation clauses and they ought to give effect to them. Uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps um, in the USA and in Australia, they've been slightly more adventurous than English courts have, certainly to date, and they're far more willing to give effect to these sorts of uh, agreements. The real problem, there's nothing particularly sophisticated about it, it's an issue that you'll all be familiar with anyway, because it's really basic contract principles. Mediation clauses are at risk if they lack certainty, if they lack completeness, and so the more certain and precise a mediation clause can be made, that the more likely it is the court will get effect to it. So my view is when you're drafting a mediation clause, if you have regard to those sort of two issues, two most important issues for the court, identifying whether or not the term has been breached or whether it's been complied with, and identifying how the court can police the term if necessary. Even if your mediation term ultimately proves to be unenforceable, it, it still seems to be a good idea to include a mediation clause in an agreement for this reason alone. At the moment, mediation is introduced to the parties as a, as a concept pretty late in the day. They're already pretty firmly locked into their dispute, and that doesn't really put them into a very receptive frame of mind. And you also have this nonsense about parties saying, well, if we suggest mediation, it's going to be seen as a sign of weakness. If you at least have a mediation clause, for the parties to address their minds to the idea of mediation at the time of forming their agreement, it seems to me they'll be far more receptive to the idea once things go wrong, and certainly will help take the sting out of this concern that if one party suggests mediation, the other party will think that they have some weakness in their case. The longer and more sophisticated uh, and involved the agreement, I would have thought the, the greater the need for a mediation clause. If you have some sort of long-term joint venture product or long-term project, for example, I've been involved in a case, there's an insolvency case that shows when it goes wrong, of a company that was retained to 
install uh, water pipes in um, Colonel Gaddafi's great man-made river project in Libya. In cases of that type, the, the project, I think, overall had a, a lifespan of 25 years, and different contractors will have obligations spanning many years. Obviously, the moment a dispute comes up, if all the parties then rush off to litigation, the chances of preserving the relationship, preserving your client's involvement in the ongoing value, the ongoing business, the ongoing profits to be made, is greatly reduced. But if you can have some sort of binding mediation clause so that people don't immediately rush to their trenches, but actually mediate, the chances of your client continuing to participate in that long-term project, that long-term contract, most importantly, that long-term ability to make money, and that seems to me highly desirable for them and for us, hopefully. So, I'll have a quick look at the, uh, my thoughts on drafting mediation clauses. The, um, Lizard warned me that the slides were designed to test your eyesight, but it would appear that the printed handout has been as well. Oh, that's better. Uh, yes, I'm sorry about the box being so small. You can you think you're all going to have lots of other diagnoses to make, which it may not be the case, based on my talk before. Um, so as I've already said, these are the key issues, key problems. Certainty, incomplete agreement, they're the main ones. Out in the jurisdiction of the court, it's not really concerned unless you go a bit mad with the draft of your clause, if you look at that at the moment. Um, and surviving termination of the contract, that sort of ground is pretty well established, the survival of terms after the contract itself has, has come to an end through breach. Slightly more difficult where the argument is the contract was void ab initio, so that you never had the agreement in the first place. But um, the courts are finding a way around that. Not a problem, of course, for arbitration, and, and you've got the 1996 Act to rely on. What I thought I'd do is have a look at two cases, one where uh, a sort of uh, mediation clause proved to be unsuccessful, and then another where the courts uh, indicated a uh, a change in, in tack. So this first one, the actually unfortunately the name of the case is around the other page, it's Halifax Financial Services and Intuitive Systems. And what the parties attempted was that in the event of a dispute arising between the parties in connection with the agreement, senior representatives of the parties would meet in good faith, their, their attack words of the court, which was in good faith unfortunately, and attempt to resolve the dispute without recourse to legal proceedings. If the dispute is not resolved, the result of such meeting, either party may propose to the other in writing uh, that structured negotiations be entered into with the assistance of a neutral advisor or mediator. Now, one of the things that the courts always had no trouble with was um, agreements to agree. And you've seen, I suspect, the House of Books decision in, in Morford and Miles and all the cases <coughs> before and after that. And the courts never liked this expression to negotiate in good faith, partly because of the difference in policing, partly because the courts always recognise that it's a perfectly legitimate negotiation tactic to just be difficult, to refuse, to walk away, to be silent, and to, to force the other party to be unreasonable. So what the court decided in that case when it was rejecting that particular clause was that it didn't have been some intention of the parties that this was to be a condition precedent um, to litigation. And uh, that's something that's, that's going to be potentially for our clauses when we draft. The other thing is, although the court was starting to recognise um, a discretion to stay, if there was something that was almost an immediate and effective agreement to arbitrate, such as expert determinations, but not quite an arbitration, but something that was pretty close, as it was in the Channel Tunnel Group. Um, it would go for that, but if it was non-determinative, like mediation, that would be sufficient. Uh, and the court would not enforce a requirement to agree in good faith negotiations, owing to the difficulties of monitoring and enforcement. So it comes back to this issue of policing the agreement. 